Welcome everybody. My name is Lucas Hample, a student physiotherapist from Brunel University, presently working with Clearwater Physical Therapy to present to you guys a series about pain. Pain is a complex process and we're going to start by unmasking it. Pun intended, it's a pandemic, we're all wearing masks. We're going to talk today about the nature of pain and how it manifests in the body. Uh, broadly speaking, this lecture series is going to be split into four portions. We're gonna to touch on today a lot of topics today just briefly, and then in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna delve into them a little bit deeper. So a quick outline of the lecture today, we'll be talking about what pain is, discussing the biology of pain, sensation versus perception as well. A very specific topic, nuances and words and how our bodies interpret them, it's important to understand. We're gonna then, then move forward to things about chronic pain and the models of how our bodies respond to injury and pain in general. We have a biopsychosocial model and a fear avoidance model. After that, we'll touch quickly on, or touch briefly on how we manage these things. Different stress reduction strategies available, sleep and the importance of exercise and actually managing pain despite the symptoms that you're experiencing. So let's get started. What is pain? The International Association for the Research, or the study of pain describes pain as an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Wide or kind of a broad title, an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience, noting here that an emotional experience can be painful as well, in the same way that when we cut ourselves or bruise something or strove or stretch something, we can feel pain that way. We can feel the emotional pain of loss or anxiety or uncertainty. And that can manifest globally or locally, depending on our situation. Noting here that it is associated with or resembling that associated with as well, there is mechanisms within our bodies and our brains and our nervous systems that can create pain directly from, as I said, an acute injury, you cut yourself, paper cut, and so forth, or scenarios where we may not have an acute injury anymore, but our body and our mind and our endocrine system and our nervous system and our hormones facilitate a pain response. There are two subtypes of pain broadly that we speak of. There's actually technically three, but we're going to touch on these kind of main two that a lot of people discuss in the normal day. We have acute pain, which usually lasts about less than three months. It's related to a cascade of events where we release chemical compounds detected by a particular type of receptor called nociceptors, and then it's interpreted as pain. Nociceptors are threat detectors, essentially, uh, detecting the potential for damage or actual acute damage. Now, this type of pattern is adaptive. It's protective. It allows our tissues to heal after an injury because we're aware of the area and we're aware that we need to let it to be, let it be more still, possibly, in order for it to heal. This contrasts with things like chronic pain, which is usually pain that lasts for more than three months. This is after usually the healing process has occurred and we have no more latent injury necessarily. It is not necessarily related to damage it becomes a non-protective at this point. Tissues are usually healed and it's merely a, it is solely a facilitation of the nervous system and the endocrine system and the immune system to continue creating pain sensations in an area. And this is not just in our heads, this is in our bodies too. When we experience persistent pain or chronic pain, as it's more commonly known, our immune system continues to create that inflammatory response. Our endocrine and hormone system, because of the anxiety around it, will continue to facilitate those type of stressors and continue to increase that pain and our pain perception. Which brings us to the next topic, a bit of biology about pain. Now I've been talking about these receptors and this sensation and all this stuff. Um, broadly speaking, when an injury occurs, the only reason we can are able to detect it is because we have sensors in those areas that are able to receive information about different external phenomena that will affect our bodies. These can include mechanical receptors like the touch on our skin or light touch or pressure or vibration, chemical receptors which can detect acids or uh, 
the contents of cells when we damage them, uh, thermal detectors which detect variations in the heat and the catalytic processes related to that, putting your hand under hot water versus hotter water versus cold water all create different sensations, and this one called nociception, which can be a broad topic as far as things go. Uh, it essentially detects the threat of damage, so if a tissue is being overstretched from a mechanical receptor or there's a change in the chemical composition, uh, that's possibly indicating that cell damage might be occurring or if the heat's so high such that nociception begins to occur. These receptors will send information to the spinal cord and then to the brain to tell the body whether or not a sensation is potentially threatening or dangerous. Now, this is just a sensation. Our body detects pain through these nociceptors, this detection of noxious sensations. The pain is in response to the damage or pain is a response to the detection of damage or the threat of damage. Very subtle difference. We're not actually responding directly to the tissue damage or the injury. It's not a direct correlation. There are extra filters through, through which these sensations go. Pain is a perceptive experience by extension. It affects our emotions, it's affected by our emotions, our feelings, and our thoughts. Think about an injury. Maybe you stubbed your toe, you look down at your foot, it immediately is very sore, the information comes to your brain, you think, ow, I stubbed my toe, oh my goodness, it hurts, that silly countertop, or that silly ledge. Why was it there? Why did I put it there? Why did I step funny? And all of these thoughts of anxiety and perceiving that pain and understanding it and interpreting it make it more painful. To give an anecdote, uh, there's a scenario that's been recorded of a person coming out of a car accident. A little bit of a um, trigger warning. Generally, it's a pretty grotesque scenario. Um, the patient came in, or an individual came in holding their arm being like, I broke my collarbone, I broke my collarbone, I broke my collarbone. They are perceiving that they can see their collarbone is broken. They can feel it. They're aware of it. They know the anxiety around breaking a bone. They're hyper-focusing on that location. Little did they know that their entire back was covered in uh, cut marks and lacerations due to the accident that they were in. They weren't aware of those sensations. Their brain perceived that break in their collarbone as the most important thing to notice. And the emotional response to it and their thoughts about how that's going to heal and their thoughts about needing it to be fixed overwhelmed the sensations of nociception that are coming from our back. So pain can be attention grabbing, but only specifically if we're able to filter through those lenses of thoughts, feelings, and emotions. The attention grabbing nature of pain is important. It helps us to be aware of when we have injuries, when there's potential for injury, to protect those body parts and make sure that our earth suit in and of itself continues to function. Persistent pain or chronic pain occurs when these noxious stimuli become, to be, become less useful. They can be repeatedly sensed for a long period of time. Maybe this is just a repeated injury over and over and over, a persistent, like, you're doing a workload, you're lifting a lot, you're lifting it effectively a lot, you hurt your back, you continue to lift for a long time. But also it can be the narratives that we present ourselves. If we think our knees are falling apart, that the joint is completely compromised, that it's the worst thing ever, that we're not going to be able to walk again, that we're going to have surgery, these anxious thoughts, feelings, and emotions we have about our knee will facilitate any pain perceptions that we have in that area. Over time, this creates a habituation to the expectation of pain by the nervous system. Our brain gets used to creating that pattern, used to being hyper aware of the sensations in that knee. And over time, sensations that are normally not perceived as painful become painful. Light touch, a little bit of pressure, a little bit of a contraction of a muscle in the area suddenly becomes exquisitely painful or broadly painful that spreads across an area. This has a knock-on effect, almost a feedback loop where it begins to feed into itself. The sensitization leads to increased awareness of these noxious stimuli. What was knocked becomes painful becomes painful. And we're more aware of that pain. Even thinking about the painful area can elicit pain without movement once you become once persistent pain settles in. Because we're aware of the area and we're aware of what we think, think the sensation will be, our brain 
cues that, uses that habituated signal and sends that information or gives you that information to proceed. But the pain may, may no longer directly be tied to damage or acute injury. It's something that exists physiologically in our biology, in our, in our bodies, and in our minds. Ultimately, that doesn't mean that it's all in your head. That means that your body is facilitating a pain pattern and there are changes that have occurred in your nervous system that help to help to engage with that as well. I was talking about these three different, this is just a tangent, kind of building into a different piece of it. What affects pain? I've been talking about the thoughts, feelings, and emotions that affect pain, but pain is just a small component. When we're younger, we may sprain an ankle, we may roll and do something to hurt ourselves, an injury occurs. What's the likelihood of that becoming persistent or chronic? Ultimately, it starts with our attitudes and beliefs around that injury. When we're young, we always think we can bounce back. We know we're going to heal. We're going to get to the next thing. We're going to keep moving. We're going to keep living. That type of narrative within our own head tends to help allow our bodies to heal and prevent that pattern, that neural pathway, that habituation from occurring. Things like psychological distress can affect this as well. Uh, significant trauma around an event, PTSD, uh, psychological factors. If we're anxious about the injury, we're anxious about getting back to sport, getting back to our lives, getting back to work, getting back to our families. These type of patterns can negatively impact the likelihood that the injury will heal, by which I mean persistent pain is more likely to set in if we're psychologically stressed or concerned about the injury, hyperfixation on it include, included. Illness behaviors are another component as well. These can be both within ourselves and around us. These illness behaviors include things like being really careful with the limb, being hyper aware of its position, being hyper aware of its potential for new damage, for the fear of continuing to damage it. It can also be these social factors, what other people perceive of your pain. This can be concerned family members telling you not to move. This can be people recommendations for bed rest. This could be practitioners like myself, like, like other medical professionals telling you, ooh, that joint is just completely destroyed. I don't know how you're walking on it. It's a surprise, but you're doing really well. Um, those type of narratives impact the illness behaviors that you'll take, create psychological distress, impact on your attitudes and beliefs about what your injury is or what your potential for recovery is and facilitate your pain. Concurrently, a different idea about pain is this pain catastrophization model and this fear-based model of pain. This one is much more palpable and much more realistic for a lot of people. Let's say you have an injury, you hurt your back, getting up from a chair or getting up from the couch or lifting something funny. You have a pain experience. The body is told there's a sensation in the back that was perceived in the brain as an injury. Possibly. Could be, could be real, could be imagined, could be something in between. We have that pain experience. We create pain-related anxiety. We are concerned about what the potential injury is, what the potential ramifications of that injury are, how we hurt ourselves and what the outcomes of that will be over time. We become concerned about, oh no, what if I'm not gonna be able to get back to work or life or the things I like to do? These anxious patterns are also influenced by negative affectivity, by which I mean negative thought patterns in the first place. So being concerned or being having rough times with anxiety or depression or stress at work or stress at home or stress in life in general, um, we're all experiencing some sort of stress with the pandemic and how we don't know whether or not life will go back to normal. Odds are it will be different. That's okay. It's just part of the process. I digress on that though. These pain-related anxieties create pain-related fear. And this is the fear of movement. This is the fear of re-injury. This is the fear of not being able to get back to what you want to do unless you're 100% healed. This can create avoidance and hypervigilance whenever we're aware of an injury or aware of an injury area. So whenever you lift something, oh, it's a little bit sore, it's a little twingy, I should stop. Oh, I shouldn't lift things anymore because I might hurt myself again. Oh, I should lift less things or I should lift lighter things all the time because my back's bad, my back's bad. 
as you've heard probably a practitioner say before, or yourself say to your set, say to your own internal narrative. This actually is a feed forward effect where you where you create disuse, you have tissues that become deconditioned. This can become depressive because you're not being able to do the things that you want to do. You're becoming frustrated or have a low mood because of the inability to interact with people in the way you thought you used to be able to. And ultimately leads to disability where you can't, you actually can't do the things you used to be able to do because you stopped doing them in the first place, which facilitates the pain experience so once again. And we can continue in this loop for a very long time. It is only when we start looking at that pain experience and addressing it and seeing what is actually happening here. Is my body actually in, in, uh, at a risk of being injured? Or is it that I've stopped using my body and it's gotten used to experiencing pain and it's gotten used to not doing things and it is possibly weaker than it was before? Recognizing this moment, recognizing this little space here and taking that extra extra time to go, I'm actually still here. I am capable of doing things, maybe at a lesser extent. That's okay. I can start moving forward. I can get that space where I'm still fearful, but I'm confident or I've improved my confrontational skills to address this pain, to address what's changed. And this allows us to begin to move towards a position of recovery, allowing our bodies to begin with a graded exercise program, a graded rehabilitation program, a graded psychological program to begin to re-engage with our lives, re-engage with our movement, and by doing so, actually decreasing the pain experience because we're no longer as anxious about it, we're not hyper vigilant about it, we're not fixated on our pain experience, we're fixated on living our lives. So how do we manage this perception portion? How do we change that narrative within our heads? Let's take a pause, let's take a pause and just recognize that if you are experiencing pain, that pain is real and how it affects your life is real as well. It doesn't matter what someone tells you if you're experiencing pain, pain is a subjective experience. It is what you perceive of it. Is your thoughts, feelings, and emotions related to it? It is how it moves through your body. There are patterns, obviously. If it's more of an electrical or kind of spreading heat, odds are it's more nerve-related. If it's acute, it's very sharp, it's very local, local tenderness, it tends to be more in tissue-related and damage-related, uh, acute or um, either way, continue, tangent as well. Um, but it is also an experience you are having. And in the same way that we can experience sadness or happiness or anger or fear or tiredness or energy, experiences change. And we can live our lives despite experiencing pain, which is a similar experience to any of these things. In the same way that if we're tired, we keep thinking about being tired, we become more tired. If we're in pain and we're experiencing pain, if we keep thinking about that pain, the pain will become more painful. It becomes more attention grabbing. It becomes more difficult for us to experience our lives. So recognizing that we can experience pain, but also live. Noticing as well that emotional or physical patterns can initiate these pain responses. As I said, there's that habituation of the nervous system where it gets used to recognizing certain movements that become pain that would become painful even if there's no injury or emotional responses that increase or exacerbate our pain recognizing when these occur to take a moment and sit back see what you did to bring that on recognize the movement and recognizing too that you can do the movement that you are capable of moving within this pain, within this experience, and still doing the things you want to do. At a different level, maybe, and that's okay. That's where you start. Identifying these cues and identifying these responses allows you to address them, allows you to confront them, allows you to figure out management strategies around them. Consider how these cues affect your body. If you're moving and you're trying to pick something up and you see something and you lean down to do so, are you actually experiencing back pain or are you experiencing a description of 
pain that could happen if you lift this thing up? Is it your own internal dialogue that is saying, I can't do these things, I can't do these things, it's going to make me more painful, it's going to make me sore, and then you experience pain? Or is it when you lift the thing, you experience a little bit of pain in your body, goes, oh no, I've re-damaged myself again, I'm really concerned, I can't lift this thing anymore. Taking a moment and stepping back from when we experience pain and looking at it, looking at the context, allows us to begin to diffuse that pathway, diffuse that ingrained narrative and ingrained pattern that facilitates our pain. So how do other ways we can manage this experience? Learning how to sleep. Sleep has been indicated as one of the most powerful tools to decrease internal stress, decrease anxieties. And when we're experiencing persistent pain, it can be very difficult pharmacological management to help with a little bit of sleep or help with pain management while we go to sleep can be a useful tool, but recognizing as well that mental exercises and finding a position that you can be the most comfortable in, whether that's on your side, on your back, propped up with a half dozen pillows, whatever works for you to allow yourself to sleep will help decrease that pain sensation. It's actually some really interesting research exploring the amount of sleep required. Usually a full night's sleep is the best thing, but even getting four or five hours of consistent slumber can help decrease pain symptomology. Stress management is important as well. As I said, pain is a lived experience. It's influenced by our thoughts, our feelings, and our emotions, and our perceptions of those emotions. Finding strategies that allow us to get out of that attention-grabbing scenario where pain is just pulling on your on all of your facilities or faculties can help decrease that pain itself this can be silly things like mindfulness exercises or meditation practices or even just really becoming invested in the things you're doing today a distraction sometimes can be useful as long as it's being used in a way that is not causing things to become significantly worse. So let's say you're going for a walk and you're feeling sore and you're feeling uncomfortable. Looking at the environment, seeing your feet, appreciating every little thing you see, focusing on other things than having that attention grabbing pain pull you back into the center can be helpful. Noticing how to, that even if we're not able to do this all the time, it is okay. If the pain pulls your back, pain pulls that focus back, that is all right too. This ties into the last component, exercise. When we move and when we breathe and when we increase our heart rate, we release endogenous endorphins, compounds that allow our bodies to feel positive, to feel energized, to feel active, things that actually inherently mitigate pain. This comes at a weird opposition to what you're used to, especially if you're experiencing pain, is I don't want to move, I want to keep this thing safe. Often, a little bit of movement is better than none. And even if that means just walking five minutes in a day, or five minutes a couple times a day, small little bits of movement, that might be doing the dishes, that might be putting something away, that might be doing a bit of vacuuming, that might be organizing a bed, that might be going for a walk down the street. Little bits of movement are more important than huge swatches of it. By doing movement and by creating these movement patterns, it tells our brains that it's okay to move. Even if we're experiencing a bit of pain, it's still okay to move. And it's still okay to keep being and keep living. If we can facilitate these type of narratives, things that tell us that even if we're experiencing pain, we can live our lives. It decreases that habituation and allows us to move forward. So that's where we're going to end the evening today. A quick review, talking about a different couple of different topics. It was a bit of a mix, mix and match environment today. I wanted to make sure we got a bit of a brief overview of kind of the general pain pathway, how our brains perceive it, how our social or how different impacts can affect our pain, and a little bit of management strategy kind of stuff, just touching on it, coloring that environment for the future. Quick review though, our body detects sensations through receptors. Sensations include heat, 
chemicals, touch, and nociception. Nociception is the detection of threatening or dangerous sensations. Um, these may not actually indicate damage, it's just the potential for damage. These sensations are then perceived as threatening or dangerous and colored by our emotions, opinions, experiences, and our awareness of the sensation. If we become hyperfixated on the potential for damage or if there was an injury and we're concerned about moving it, this can facilitate that pain perception pattern and actually create that habituation within the brain to affect the body, creating more pain. Persistent pain does occur, and it occurs when the nervous system and the body start to interpret non-threatening sensations as threatening, and also creating pain endogenously within our own bodies through persistent stress, persistent anxiety, persistent nerve habituation in those areas. Thanks everyone for listening to this first little lecture. I hope you learned something. Next week, we're gonna dig into more of the biology of pain, more of the physiology, what nerves are, how nerves interact, how they send information in the brain and what can happen to them when we start experiencing pain or persistent pain. If you have any questions, now's the time. Thanks everybody, have a good evening. If you're interested, there's a little bit of extra literature I kind of posted at the back. Explain Pain is a great book by David Butler and Dr. Mortimer, Mortimer Mosley that gives you essentially what I'm presenting today. Um, in a fairly accessible way, they talk about pain, pain perception, how it affects our brains, how it affects our bodies, what we can do about it as well. A couple interesting studies as well, the effects of sleep recovery on pain perception systematic review great literature, just an exploration of how sleep recovery and sleeping allows pain to decrease, as well as the role of emotion regulation in chronic pain, discussing ideas about how decreasing stress or decreasing um, anxious affective states or depressive affective states can actually decrease our pain as well.